Isaiah 53. So if you're looking in the hard copies this morning, you can turn in Isaiah 53. We'll put the scriptures up for the rest of you. Uh, I'll give more detail next week on um, who Isaiah the prophet was and, and why he wrote his prophecies. But I want to start this morning with important understandings that Isaiah is truly a prophecy about Jesus the Redeemer. Now, I don't know if you've ever studied the book of Isaiah. I'm really enjoying working through it. But everything you read in Isaiah should be permeated with an understanding of the need for Jesus, the provision of Jesus, and the result of what Jesus brings. Uh, there's a theologian named Victor Buxbazen, and he, he wrote a book on Isaiah, and he says this. I love this. Behind all the oracles of the book of Isaiah, there is the same man with the same message, God's wrath and mercy, sin and judgment, exile and restoration. His message throughout the whole book is radiant with the vision of the Messiah, the anointed servant of God. His exalted and redemptive life and vicarious death and the final triumph of his glorious kingdom. Because this is ultimately the story of Jesus, he goes on to state, the New Testament quotes more frequently from the book of Isaiah more than all of the other books of the Old Testament put together. The New Testament quotes from the book of Isaiah more than all the other books of the Old Testament put together. So this is an important book. Isaiah 53 that we're going to look at this morning drips with a saturation of the gospel in every single verse. It is a joy for me to kick off our holiday season by celebrating the Lord's Supper with the words from Isaiah 53 this morning. So let's look at it together. And right off the bat, the first four verses of Isaiah 53 is a Christmas prophecy. Now, many of our beautiful Christmas language, not just that we recite and put on uh, plaques and on cards, but a lot of the songs we sing, the Christmas carols, come right out of the book of Isaiah. Chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 especially. Beautiful language about the Prince of Peace. Well, Isaiah 53 starts off with the idea of Christmas in verses 1 through 4, and here's what it says. And recognize, and we understand this, so you're, you're already now going to start seeing people put out their little nativity sets, and you're going to see Jesus there in that little trough of hay under like a little barn or a cave. And, and we recognize if Jesus was a king, we celebrate every year the fact that he didn't come looking like a king. He didn't come in all the pomp and circumstance that normal kings came in. And that's exactly what these first few verses are about. It says in verse 1, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. The prophet Isaiah here is talking about one who's coming. One who's coming to make everything better that's been broken. Someone who's coming to undo all the wrongs and make them all right. And he says he's not going to come like you're expecting him to come. Of course, Israel was waiting for their Messiah, their king who's going to sit on the throne. And Isaiah says, hey, you're going to miss it because you're going to be looking for the wrong things. So much emphasis was placed on the beauty and glory of royalty, yet Jesus was not born in beauty and glory. Isn't it interesting? We are so plutonic as humans. We're so shallow. We look for the, the, the bling, and we look for the, the glamour, and we look for the shiny things, and we look for the things that, that even in the gospel make church look better. So much of church today is about making it beautiful to this culture, and yet Isaiah says the gospel isn't going to be about what is beautiful and glorious. It's going to be about what makes people whole. And it's going to come in simplicity. And so we see here a Christmas prophecy. Look at verses 3 and 4. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah is is telling of the Plutonic nature of the Israelites. He says, you're always looking for what benefits you in God, and, and that's how you approach this relationship with God. God, how can you bless me? I'm willing to serve you, but how can you bless me? And you're gonna miss it when the Redeemer shows up. 
because you're going to be looking for something that is about you, something that makes you happy, something that is shiny, something that is new, something that is glorious, magnanimous, and you're going to miss the simplicity of the provision. You know, we don't just celebrate what Jesus did in death. We also celebrate what Jesus was willing to do in life. He willingly left his father, Philippians chapter 2 tells us, and he assumed the form of a servant, and he had to live amongst this very humanity that was cursing and mocking his father, that was spurning the glorious plan that he had provided. What a kindness and grace Jesus did in living for us. I want you to look at the next few verses. In the next few verses, we see a prophecy of the Lord's Supper or Passover. Verse 5 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. He's speaking of the Messiah serving as the Passover lamb, dying for the sins of the world, prophesying the work of Jesus. It says in verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. Jesus was that one sheep, that one Passover lamb who did explicitly what God commanded. He was the one sheep who did everything God had commanded him to do on this earth. He was the one sinless person, and yet he was the sheep that had to die for all the rest of us. All the wandering sheep. God's one perfect lamb died for all the wandering sheep. All the ones who had committed all the sins. And he did that so that we could have peace. Christ's punishment purchased our peace. And he took the punishment that we deserve to take. That's what he's speaking of here. This is the language. Look at verse 7. It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. This is saying that Jesus willingly did this. He didn't have to be forced on that cross. He laid his life on that cross. He willingly took the nails. He willingly was raised and faced our condemnation. Jesus willingly surrendered to the condemnation and execution we deserved. And he did not defend himself, even though he had the right to. He could have called 10,000 legions of angels to, to his side, and yet he willingly surrendered his life. That's the picture of the Lord's Supper. That's the picture of Jesus embodying the Passover that Isaiah is prophesying about here. And so I think this is a fitting moment to stop and celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I want to draw your attention to Luke chapter 22. And we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper right now. You Kids, if you're holding on to that little grape juice, if you haven't spilled it yet, great job. I know some of the adults already have. You're doing better than them. Hold on to that. We'll open it together and Fair warning, when you open that thing, it might explode. So just be ready. I always wear white. It works out great for me. Jesus was with his disciples the night of the Passover. And he wanted to celebrate the Passover with them, not because he was supposed to, which he was, certainly was, not because that was the, uh, the whole focus of that weekend, which it was, but because he wanted to get to something specific that he wanted his disciples to understand about what he was about to do. In verse 14, it says this. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, something's about to happen, and we're going to celebrate our last Passover meal together, and you're not going to celebrate this again with me until we're in the kingdom. Now, we know Jesus didn't celebrate the Passover again. He went to be with his Father. He was pointing forward to a day when all of Christ's church will be together as his bride, and we will be celebrating the Passover in his presence. It says, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So he's setting up a scenario here. Something's about to happen. Something is about to shift. I've been with you guys for three and a half years. 
We've served together. We've worshiped together. We've gone to the temple to pray together. And now I'm about to do something different. I'm about to take on my rightful role, the, the role that God has given to me to take on to be the Passover lamb. So now he wants to use this moment to teach them some very important things about himself. Really, for us, this is about the gospel. And so here's what it says. It says in verse 19, And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Now, they would have taken unleavened bread, it would have been bread that wasn't leavened. And they did this because in the original Passover, they understood that they were getting ready to leave Egypt. They were getting ready to run for their lives. The death angel was going to come. He was going to execute the final plague, and they were going to be free. And they wouldn't have time to let the bread rise. They had to take their food, and they had to get out of Egypt. But that bread represented something deeper. Because in the scriptures, leaven reminds us of sin. The Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you committed even one sin, your entire life is decimated by sin. We have to pay for that sin somehow. The Bible says that for the wages of sin is death. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus wanted them to understand that moment that he was about to give them a gift, a gift of perfect sinlessness. His body had no leaven in it at all. So he says, I want you to take this bread. We're going to break it together. And I want you to eat it in remembrance of me. Jesus used all the senses when he taught. He taught in parables. He taught from the Old Testament scriptures. He took physical illustrations like flowers or birds and here he takes something very tactile, taking a piece of cracker, wafer, placing it in your mouth, and watching it disintegrate into your body. Now the Catholic Church believes that it changes form and becomes the literal body of Christ. We, as Protestants, we don't read this scripture this way. What we understand is Jesus wanted them to see that bread going into their body, being digested into their body, and reminding them that Jesus was about to give them the opportunity to take his righteousness into their very bodies and give Jesus all of their sin in exchange. It was an exchange that was about to happen. All of their sin debt would be paid, and they would receive all of Christ's righteousness. And so he says, this little piece of bread represents what I'm about to do for you. And then it says this, and likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. There were four cups celebrated at Passover. Jesus stops at the third cup. He stops at the cup that's reminding them of what he's going to do in shedding his blood and paying for their sins, there's a fourth cup that still has to be celebrated. And so that fourth cup of that Passover, we will celebrate with him in glory someday. But at that third cup, he says, I want you to recognize what I'm about to do. I'm about to shed all my blood on the cross. All of my blood is going to be shed so that all of your blood can be spared. And just as we slaughter these, these Passover lambs and we let the blood run out and we cook the flesh and we eat of it, I am going to put my life on the line. I'm going to shed my blood so that your life can be spared, so that you can have eternal salvation. You know, I want to say something to you this morning. Maybe you're here, and there's never been a time where you have received the blood sacrifice of Jesus. There's never been a time where you remember saying to Jesus, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know my sin has condemned me to death. I know I should be paying for my sin, but I want to give you my sin. I want to have your righteousness. I trust you for my salvation, and I give you my soul. If you've never prayed that prayer, then what we are doing is just a ritual for you. It means nothing for you. What makes this real, what makes this special is the understanding that I have literally given Jesus my sin, even the sins I have yet to commit that I can confess and receive forgiveness for. I am giving him my sin. In exchange, I'm taking a hold of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I am letting it wash over my sin, and I'm receiving his righteousness. His perfect standing before God is my standing before God. 
And I want to challenge you this morning, if you've never prayed a prayer of salvation, if you've never asked God to rescue you from your sin, do that right now in your heart, in your mind. Just say, God, I need you. My sin is real. I need you to take my sin, give me your righteousness, make me your child. And this will mean something very special for you. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no payment for sin. And so Jesus said, take that cup. Look at that wine. It is red. My blood is red. And it's about to be shed for you. And I'm about to do what you cannot do. I'm going to cover your sins. So let's drink this cup and remember what I'm about to do for you. He says something interesting next. He says, Behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the son of man, the son of man goes as has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was doing this. Understand, the Lord's Supper leads us to question ourselves. Just as Jesus looked at his disciples and said, One of you is going to betray me, and he didn't say who it was. And it naturally caused them to say, was it me? Am I going to betray you? God, am I going to walk out on you? God, am I going to despise what you've done for me? Am I going to lack faith? And that is the right question. Because that should be the question we ask ourselves every day. God, am I playing Judas in my life today? Look back at my last week, Father. What, where have I been Judas in my life? Where have I betrayed you in my sin? Where have I turned my back on you? Where have I clung to my idols? I want to confess those things. God, here's my propensity. Here's my struggle. Here's what I'm going to struggle with this week. And you know this. Please forgive me for the sins I'm about to do. And God, thank you for that forgiveness. You see, we all play the Judas. And so it is fitting that in these moments we look at our own life and ask those hard questions. God, am I really set apart? Am I really living as I ought to live in light of your sacrifice? I want to turn your attention back to the end of Isaiah chapter 53. And I wanted to look, just look at a couple verses from verses 8 through 12 because this is the celebration of the victory of the gospel. He's foreshadowing the Easter celebration. Now, we don't recognize this as Easter. That's really more of a, a secular word. Uh, we celebrate the Lord's Resurrection Sunday. But here's the thing. Isaiah didn't understand that this was about the Lord's resurrection. He didn't understand the whole story yet. He just knows God's going to send his Redeemer. And he just knows the Redeemer is going to fix everything that is broken. And so we see here, even as Isaiah doesn't understand the resurrection of Christ, he understands the victory that the Messiah is going to bring. Look at verse 8. It says, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. He's talking about Jesus. And as far as his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Isaiah prophesies what we understand. Jesus died with criminals. He died with a criminal on each side, and then he's laid in a rich man's borrowed tomb. That's the language here of Easter weekend. Look at verse 10. Yet it was will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus was doing a work, and I want you to understand something here. Jesus didn't die for you. He didn't die for me. Jesus died for God. God asked Jesus to die. In fact, Jesus looked at God and said, is there another way I can redeem my people? In the garden, he cried tears of blood, saying, God, is there, is there another way to do this? And God said, no, I'm asking you to be the Passover lamb. And Jesus said, if that's your will, I will do it, and I will do it gladly. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he suffered the cross. And so we see here the reality that Jesus deserved glory not because he died for you and I. We're the recipients of that gift. He died for the will of God. God asked his own son to pay the price. And that's why on the cross he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm doing this for you. I feel alone. And in that moment, Jesus felt alone all the weight of the sin of the entire history of humankind. Can you imagine Look at verse 11. 
Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. This is the doctrine of justification that we talk about in life groups this last week, if you go to a life group. Timothy Keller led in a discussion about justification, and the word justification means just as if I'd never sinned, or just as if I'd always obeyed. And Isaiah is prophesying here that because Jesus is perfect, because the coming Messiah will be perfect, and he will do everything perfectly, when he gives his life and sacrifice, it will bring about the righteousness of God for his people. I love the, sec- the, the verse Paul states in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, he became sin who knew no sin, that is Jesus, so that we might in turn become his righteousness. Look at verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is similar to Philippians 2 that says that Jesus, because he gave his life, because he humbled himself as a servant, has been highly exalted at the right hand of God. It's an incredible thought. I love this idea that Jesus is being exalted. You know, we talk about asking Jesus into your heart. You don't ask Jesus into your heart. Jesus isn't here. The Holy Spirit comes into your heart. Jesus is at the right hand of God right now. And this is what Isaiah is prophesying. He is interceding for you. He is interceding for me. And when the accuser comes and accuses us of sin, Jesus stands in our stead and he says, I have paid for that sin. They have confessed that sin and they have my righteousness. This beautiful and encouraging prophecy ends in verse 12. With the freedom for confession. And he says he makes intercession for our transgressions. Isn't that awesome? Think about your transgressions. I mean, think about your body and the transgressions it commits. Think about your lips. The transgressions from our lips that Jesus is making intercession for right now in our struggle with lying and gossip and being angry and being critical. And we continue to struggle with our lips. And Jesus is continuing to make intercession for our transgression of our lips. Think about the transgressions from our thoughts. We have impure thoughts. We have covetous thoughts, we have critical thoughts, we have doubting thoughts, and Jesus is continually making intercession for the transgression of our thoughts. Think about our hands and the transgressions from our hands, stealing, cheating, violence, and Jesus is continuing to make intercession for the transgressions of our hands. Think about our feet, going where we should not be going, running from doing what God has asked us to do, And God continually makes intercession for the transgressions of our feet. Think about our eyes. Looking at things that are dishonoring to God. Looking and not addressing injustice and unkindness in this world. And yet God is still making intercession for the transgressions of our eyes. In every transgression, Jesus is actively making intercession for us. We must name the sin but we must also claim God's forgiveness. You've heard this. A lot of our prosperity preachers like to to preach the idea of name it and claim it. That's, That's not true. We don't name what we want and then claim it. God doesn't give us whatever we want. The one thing we can name and claim is God's forgiveness. We name our sin. We're honest about it. We declare it. And then we claim God's forgiveness that he has offered us. We name it and claim it. And that should happen every day when we get up And we pray and ask God for strength for the day. God, here's my sin. Here's what I did. Here's my struggle. Here's what I might do. I'm naming it. Now I'm claiming your forgiveness. Thank you for interceding for me. Thank you for interceding for my transgressions.